What's good, Deck Gang? Welcome back to my channel, where I bring you the latest Steam Deck and PC handheld news. In today's first story, Valve just teased the latest Steam Deck update that's coming to the Stable channel soon. Yeah, Valve is getting ready to bring SteamOS 3.6 to Stable, but it's not nearly as feature-packed as SteamOS 3.5 was, and in fact, it feels like there's not much here depending on how you look at it. I'll tell you what to keep an eye on and what they may be preparing for with this update. There's also some interesting news about recent games and how they they perform on deck, as well as a litany of announcements for PC handhelds in general. So let's dive right into that first story. Late last week, Valve developer Pierre Liu tweeted that SteamOS 3.6.12 is now in beta and teased that this is a first release candidate for SteamOS 3.6 to come into the stable channel. If you don't know what that means, up until now, SteamOS 3.6 has only been in the beta channel or in the preview channel. Those two channels are for testing and previewing upcoming features for SteamOS, but they're not meant to be considered stable. This is mostly only helpful if you want to be on the bleeding edge. Typically, by the time these 3.x versions of SteamOS arrive in stable, they'll have already accumulated a notable amount of features. With SteamOS 3.1, we got a lock screen and support for multiple windows. In 3.2, we got a new refresh rate slider that helped us fine tune our experience. SteamOS 3.3 was pretty big as it coincided with the release of the Steam Deck dock and brought us some long awaited features for dock mode. 3.4 brought us performance profiles that allowed us to save our per game performance configurations. It also came with a new horizontal layout for the performance overlay and introduced a screen tearing toggle. Then, of course, was the big one, SteamOS 3.5. This was a huge update that openly introduced support for a number of features that would benefit their secret new hardware, the Steam Deck OLED. That included HDR, battery improvements, updated Bluetooth support, and much more. In contrast to those... The update to SteamOS 3.6 seems relatively meager. They did add driver support for Windows on Deck, and there have been a ton of upgrades to different dependencies like the Linux kernel, Mesa drivers, and the desktop environment. But as far as features for people that are just playing games on SteamOS, there is not much new here, at least not in the OS itself. The biggest Steam Deck features that Valve have been working on since SteamOS 3.5 was released are not in the operating system, but instead in the client. I'm referring to features like family sharing, game recording, and the new gyro to mouse mode, which is a better way to enjoy gyro on the Steam Deck. To me, this indicates that SteamOS itself is relatively mature and they're able to focus on features for gamers within the Steam client itself rather than with upgrades to SteamOS. I personally have put in a ton of time into family sharing, game recording, and gyro to most while they've still been in beta, and they have all been incredibly helpful at various levels of bugginess. Family sharing seems ready to come out of beta, and as far as I can tell, I would say the same for gyro to mouse. Game recording is still pretty rough in my experience, and it's going to likely need some more time in the oven before it should come to the stable channel, but I've also been enjoying that nonetheless, so there's that. Given that SteamOS is fairly mature, however, it does make me wonder what else the SteamOS developers may be working on. You know, it's possible that they've moved on to one of Valve's many other projects like SteamVR and Deckard or Deadlock or one of the two Half-Life titles they're allegedly working on or just Steam client features. Clearly, the list is endless and Valve is a small company, so who can say? But for the team members that would be considered specialists in the development of operating systems, I hope that they're working on generic support for SteamOS, especially with all the big news around new handhelds that I'm going to tell you about later in this video. What do you think they're working on? Definitely leave a comment below the like button and let's discuss. By the way, there were two more updates that Valve added to the Steam Deck that I wanted to mention here briefly. The first is a dedicated customizable shortcut for easily saving a clip of recent gameplay. Thanks to Gaming on Linux for this picture, but yeah, you can see that in the game recording settings, you can customize how long you want these clips to be, and then you can customize that shortcut that you want to set for saving that clip. Personally, something like the last 60 seconds would be perfect for me. And also, I will say that it didn't show up for me when I updated the Steam Deck, and this may be only limited to desktop Steam for the time being, but it will be useful for me once it does eventually land on the Steam Deck. The last thing to mention as it relates to Steam Deck updates is that Valve have now released what is likely their last main driver that was needed for Windows support on the Steam Deck OLED. The Steam Deck Twitter account posted that they have released the third audio driver with this one now enabling speakers for the OLED. Very nice. 
And one more thing to say around the subject of just Valve and all the things they have going, although Valve does run a tight ship with a notoriously small amount of employees, they do often look for help outside. And sometimes rarely, they even go as far as to bring on larger teams as full-time employees. The most recent such story is Valve hiring a number of talented developers from Hapu Games. That is the team behind Risk of Rain. Their tweet says that they're going to be working on game development directly at Valve. And as a result, they are halting development on their unannounced game, Snail. They also stated that they're thankful, quote, for their partnerships with Valve in the last decade and that they're, quote, excited to be working side by side with the talented people at Valve, end quote. This reminds me of Valve acquiring Campo Santo in 2018. The developers of that team ended up halting development on their next game in the Valley of the Gods, and primarily they worked on what would become Half-Life Alex, which launched about two years later. Perhaps in two years, we will be able to learn what Hapu Games developers are currently working on. I'm looking forward to it. So Space Marine 2 was released late last week and is a game that I've personally been waiting for. Thankfully, user and industry reviews both agree that this game plays just as good as it looks and it will be a game of the year candidate as we look to close the year. Unfortunately, it doesn't play very well on the Steam Deck just yet, but that's not the end of the story. This game is all about the hordes of enemies whose numbers seem ridiculous when you see them on screen, and so you would expect that that in fact would cause a problem on the Steam Deck and cause it to chug quite a bit. That said, the developers of this game at Focus Entertainment have committed to supporting this game on the Steam Deck by the end of the year. This was reported by Steam Deck HQ and comes from a community update that was shared on the Focus Entertainment forums. There was a bit of an FAQ and one of the questions answered was, will this game be playable on the Steam Deck? Their response to this was, we are working on official Steam Deck support, but it's not ready yet. We're currently targeting the end of the year for full Steam Deck support, end quote. That is good news. And if you can't wait until then, I do have two suggestions for you. Well, two suggestions outside of just playing on a desktop or just streaming from your desktop using remote play. The first suggestion is that you can try the FSR 3.1 mod that Deck Wizard has showed off on his channel. To be honest, it does still look a bit rough and it's not how I would want to play the game, not to mention the input lag, but it may get you to something playable if you're really looking to play this on the go right now. The second suggestion I would say is to play the original Space Marine in the meantime. It plays incredibly well on the Steam Deck and is currently on sale for 70% off on GOG.com. Try that out. Another game that did not play extraordinarily well on the Steam Deck at launch was Black Myth Wukong, which released a little over two weeks ago now. That, however, didn't stop it from becoming one of the top played games on Steam Deck, and even now it sits at the top of the list of most played Steam Deck games. Thankfully, even though initial performance was relatively rough, they recently released a patch that has considerably improved the gameplay. At this point, I'm no longer seeing traversal stutters and the game looks pretty great. Personally, I've been playing this on the ROG Ally X at 20 watts using Bazite, and I've gotten through the first two chapters with no performance issues. Next, and while not Steam related, I did want to mention two more updates, one for Baldur's Gate 3 and one for No Man's Sky. They both got really big updates this past week. The new update to Baldur's Gate 3 introduces official mod support by way of a mod manager and a brand new mod toolkit. By using the toolkit, mod developers can ensure that they can upload their creation to the game, allowing other users to download and install that mod via the mod manager. No Man's Sky, on the other hand, just launched their big Aquarius update. The big addition here is fishing, taking advantage of all the fun new water physics and features that were added in the prior Worlds update. In other PC handheld news, Acer announced two hardware projects. One is the Nitro Blaze 7, which is their first PC handheld. And as of right now, it looks pretty unremarkable compared to other offerings. Unlike the RLG Allies and the Legion Go, it's actually powered by the Ryzen 8040. Additionally, it sports a native landscape 1080p panel with a 144 hertz refresh rate. Finally, it has a 50 watt hour battery and 16 gigabytes of 7,500 mega transfer per second memory. Although I think this doesn't do too much to stand out against its contemporaries, I do hope that that means they're going to be able to compete on price in this sector. More interestingly, though not a handheld, is the new Acer Project Dual Play concept. Although this is still, in fact, a concept, meaning that we have no idea if Acer intends to actually manufacture this, it is at least intriguing with a controller that is stored in the chassis using electromagnets. It can be removed and used easily, making it a convenient way to travel with a control pad if you want to do laptop gaming on the go. 
Likewise, AMD has just confirmed their next generation handheld chip, the AMD Z2. This would be the follow-up to the Z1 line, most notably of which is of course the Z1 Extreme. That is the chip that powers the most popular Windows handhelds like the ROG Ally, the Ally X, and the Lenovo Legion Go. Honestly, there's not too much to report other than AMD's own claims that it will quote, boost high end performance mode battery life from 45 minutes to three hours, end quote. Personally, I'm taking these claims with a grain of salt, trust, but verify if you will. And I'm gonna wait to see this chip in action before making any judgment. If you're looking for some tangible performance improvements in Windows handhelds, however, be sure to check out the 24H2 update to Windows 11. It was reported a couple weeks ago that this update improves CPU performance on a number of Ryzen chips. Notably, because this improvement is limited to CPU, you won't necessarily see gains in the most gaming scenarios, but you will see big improvements in CPU limited scenarios, which include PS3 emulation. RPCS3 recently tweeted a comparison showing that it does in fact have a noticeable difference here. Keeping with Windows improvements aimed at gaming, Microsoft is rolling out a new keyboard layout that will make typing in Windows using a control pad much more convenient. You can swap to this layout in the keyboard settings and it's specifically meant to be navigated with a gamepad. The keyboard keys are now vertically aligned and you can use the X button for backspace as well as the Y button for spacebar. It's good to see Microsoft consider and implement features that are useful for gamers on their systems. Emudeck have also recently announced their new Emudeck machines. This will be Emudeck's first attempt at hardware as they are known for their all-in-one emulation, installation, and configuration application. Say that five times fast. The Emudeck machine is a mini PC with a silhouette matching the Dreamcast that's aimed at retro gamers and will be leveraging their software for easy configuration of your retro collection. It's powered by Bazite and is being crowdfunded on Indiegogo. The first option is a pre-built machine, which comes complete with the Ryzen 8600G, 512 gigabyte NVMe drive, and 16 gigabytes of DDR5 memory at 6,000 megatransfers per second. The early bird price for that option is $673 without a controller or $695 with. There is also a DIY kit that comes with the case and a 200 watt PSU, and that's going to run you about $165 US dollars. Personally, I did take the plunge on this so that I could review it, but the sticker price does sting and I'm not sure what Emmy deck is going to be able to do to make it worthwhile, especially if you might have some hardware lying around that you would be able to repurpose. What do you think? On the subject of Bazite, I'd also like to point out that Bazite has a new update that makes it even easier to install. With release 3.7.0, you can now install Bazite without a keyboard, which is a great quality of life addition for users that will be installing without a keyboard. There's also news of a new Xbox One emulator, or maybe don't call it an emulator because Xwine One is a brand new translation layer for Windows PCs with six games currently playable, including Undertale and Minecraft. Unfortunately, there is currently no way to test this for ourselves. The developers say that this is not yet ready for public consumption and that they will most likely open source the project alongside its first binary release to the public. They do know a few Xbox One exclusives that you may be anxious to try on your PC, including Halo 5 Guardians, Crimson Dragon, and the game that I'm personally waiting for, Rare Replay. Unfortunately, this is not likely to come to Linux as it requires support for WinRT and UWP apps, which Wine and Proton currently do not support. A new fan game just launched and I figure it's a pretty big deal. This one is Super Mario Eclipse. It's been in development for over five years and it's essentially a total conversion of Super Mario Sunshine. There are 120 brand new shines, three playable characters, an improved engine, new movement mechanics, new and remixed boss fights, a brand new story with hand animated cutscenes, and apparently a massive reward for 100% completion. This is already playable on Dolphin as well as modified consoles and requires the US version of the game. Likewise, the original Banjo-Kazooie recently reached the milestone of being 100% decompiled. 100% decompilation means that the community was able to completely reverse engineer the source code in such a way that allows to make a one-to-one -one replica of the game when we go back to recompile the source code. With this completely reverse engineered code, the community can now begin working on PC ports and enhancements. Exciting times are ahead for Banjo-Kazooie. All right, that gang, that's going to do it for this week's episode. I hope you're all having a wonderful week. That gang out. Goodbye.